Well, hello everyone. Um, we're so glad to have you at today's program. My name is Zachary Burt. I'm the Community Outreach and Grants Manager at the DC Preservation League. And I'm joined today by my coworker, Isabel Hausman, who is running the live stream on Facebook. For those of you who may be new to DCPL, we are Washington DC's citywide nonprofit founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic built environment of the nation's capital. I have a few things to go over before we get started. First, I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors, whose annual financial support helps underwrite free programs like this one today. They are the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, QTAC Rock, Douglas Development Corporation, Antunovich Associates, Bayer Blender Bell, EHT Traceries Inc., KCE Structural Engineers, and Quinn Evans. Thank you all for your dedication to historic preservation in DC. Moving on, we have a few notes on how today's webinar will run. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions, and we will go through those towards the end of the program. The chat will not be available during the presentation, but will be open for the discussion period. For those joining us on Facebook, Isabel will be monitoring any questions you might have and sending them our way on Zoom. Now that we've covered that, I'm so pleased to introduce you to today's speaker, and I will stop sharing. And John, you can you can start sharing as I go through your bio. John okay. Sander has worked as an architectural historian in the Technical Preservation Services branch of the National Park Service since 1996. He reviews rehab projects seeking certification for federal tax credit and provides assistance to the users of the program, the general pub public on technical aspects of preservation. He previously worked as the architectural coordinator for the West Virginia State Historic Preservation Office and has experience as a preservation consultant and a carpenter. He is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University in architecture. John is a past president of the DC Preservation League and the Latrobe chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians. So welcome, John. We're excited for today's presentation. Thanks, Zach. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to talk to you about uh, windows, and particularly windows for historic buildings. Uh, I would guess that if you're here, then it means you're either passionate about saving historic windows or else um, you have some problem with the windows in your property. <laughs> so uh, I'm not seeing the slides advance here, Zach. What what am I not doing right? Um, when you clicked, it didn't change. Let me, no, hmm. let me, let me see what, like, the cursors are not moving the slides. See your mouse. Can you use your keyboard to do the arrow? All right. You know, it, there we go. Oh, there we go. Out, there, there we go. All right. Go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> windows are just a are just a component of our buildings, and I think we tend to overlook just how important a role they play in the establishing the character of, of these buildings. These two images, I think, illustrate that point rather well. The, the buildings on the left are uh, ones that are quite modern and someone spent a, a, by a local architect that was very skillful at introducing compatible features to, to make them fit into the historic neighborhood. And they spent a lot of money on a lot of those details. But if you look at the windows, they, they're kind of flat and, and slender. I guess they let in more light without much frame, but they look a little more than storm windows. Whereas if you compare that to the building on the right, where the windows have some three-dimensionality, they have some detailing to them, it, it adds a lot more substance and character to the building itself. These two images, though, illustrate the point of uh, that many of our buildings no longer have historic windows. And often this is what you're going to be faced with when you're, uh, when you're dealing with a historic property someone else may have already robbed you of the opportunity to keep the historic window. And I think it also just illustrates how, how poor uh, many of the choices are that, that have been made to replace windows in historic buildings. If you compare the, the vinyl window installed on the left with the wood window on the right. So for today's limited time, we're gonna focus really on wood hung windows, which are the most common window in the United States and, and certainly in our homes. Um, and we're going to look at, well, what are some of the issues that you might have with windows in 
in particular, and what are some of the solutions that you might have to them? So when, when people are having a problem with their windows, we, we hear all of these things. You can't get them open or keep them open. They rattle in the wind. You feel cold next to them. They just look awful. You're spending too much money on heating and cooling, and you're sure the windows are the problem. And they always seem to need paint. Uh, but what are reasonable goals that our windows should do for us? They should be sound, physically sound, stable. They should be operable. They need to be safe. Uh, we don't want people falling out of them, and we don't want people being poisoned by them if they have lead paint on them. Um, they, we want a certain measure of energy efficiency, though a window can never be quite as good as a wall. Uh, and we want to be comfortable when we're in the space that the windows are lighting. Now, we might want them to be maintenance-free, but that's a little bit of a squirrely agenda because anything that's maintenance-free means that when it's needs when it has a problem, it means you're just going to have to replace it. And if you, and, and that may be a valid approach. That's how we generally approach roofing now. You know, we put roofing shingles on that last for 20 to 50 years, and then we replace them. We don't, there's not much you can do to fix them in the, min, in the meantime. Uh, and windows may be the same. If, if you can't find someone to repair them, then maybe you do just replace them every 30 years. But that seems an awfully wasteful approach for something when we're worried about environmental uh, issues these days. Um, can you achieve these goals with repair or do you need to replace? Well, that will depend upon your window. You can repair almost anything. From, uh, but it, the question is, is it reasonable to do? And can you find somebody to do it? Sometimes replacement is what is needed. I'm not here to say that you shouldn't be, that you should never replace a window. And there are going to be a lot of windows that are going to be on that middle ground where maybe they could be repaired, but is it, you know, what's the lifespan of the window if you do the repair or can you find someone to do it and what would it cost and how does that cost compare with that of a new window? Um, to decide whether you need to replace the window or if it's reasonable to repair it, you need to do an assessment of that. And the things that we need to be thinking about, some of them are pretty obvious, but all of them aren't. Certainly the condition of the wood, the, the integrity of the frame, that being the jam, the frame around the, that holds the sash, the sash itself. How does that sash fit within the frame? Does it operate? Uh, what's the condition of the glass? Is any of it broken? And is the putty failing that holds the glass in place. Most windows are, the glass is held in place with putty. Some use wood stops, particularly more modern ones. What's the condition of the paint? And does the paint contain lead? And, and to have the window safe from a lead perspective, um, it really it's critical that the if you have, if the paint is proved to be lead, that the friction surfaces be stripped of the paint. That it's Paint, lead's not like popping off the window randomly. It's, lead is heavy. It doesn't get airborne very readily. It settles out quickly. But if you have surface of red paint rubbing against surface of lead paint, you have children in the house, you probably need to take that seriously if you're opening and closing the windows and think about re remediating that. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to get rid of the whole window. Um, wood deterioration can range from... Uh, minor things that could probably be fixed with a little epoxy to something like this sill on the right, which is so checked, there's no, you do have more epoxy than you have wood if you tried to repair that. The sill at the bottom left there, that's probably letting water into the, into the wall. That, you know, there's no way to fix that. That needs to be replaced. And modern latex paints can cover a, a, a host of sins. They're pretty flexible and until they start to peel, but you can see here uh, uh, the wood's kind of missing underneath the paint in that red window. It's been someone just painted over the rot and it hasn't it hasn't popped off yet. It's just a matter of time. Sometimes the conditions look worse than they are. If the joints are are the joints are really a, a critical place to look. It's where water leaks in most and deterioration tends to start. You can see the the staining on the in the photo on the right, but that joint still looks pretty sound. It's not it hasn't failed. Uh, and it's possible that might be repaired with a little uh, a little uh, attention. Uh, the window at the bottom where you want to look is at the joints where things meet, like particularly the silt, the jam. The the sash illustrated there has is missing some material along the bottom edge. Uh, could that be repaired? Possibly. Would it be justified to replace it? Possibly. 
Some of the things where you really can't reasonably fix it, though, would be where, like the condition in the circle there on the left, where the wood is, is so far gone that that joint isn't stable anymore. The trim on the outside is, is, has warped off. And if you tried to nail it back, there'd be nothing to nail it to. The very basic bones of the window, the jam, the frame of it are not sound anymore. And there'd be no way to fix that. The pen is, is a half inch deep into that joint where the jam meets the sill in the middle picture. That's a window that needs to be replaced. Uh, you can epoxy that stuff, but you, you probably aren't going to have a stable window. And and I, I think epoxy is best used when it can be used sparingly. Um, one thing we tend to forget about, though, is is the way the win the the sash fits within the window. Uh, the window on the left is a window that would rattle. If I can stick the pen between the jam and the window, there's the the sash is too small for the frame or the frame is bowed out and, the, and it's not no longer going to make a good fit. Um, it's possible that that could be fixed by replacing the sash alone, but you need to make sure the frame itself is still true and square because then even a new sash won't work if the frame is bowed and has moved over time. And th that's often the case. And even though a lot of our buildings in Washington are brick buildings, they move sometimes, not that we want them to, but they do. And then we end up with openings that aren't square anymore. And if you look at the window on the right, um, you can see that it, uh, the far right of that picture, the, the sash meets the sill. There's a very narrow, dark line. But on the left, there starts to be a gap. And that means the window isn't really quite square. The sash is, the sash is rectilinear, but where it hits the sill, there's a gap. And weather stripping can help a little bit, but weather stripping is meant to seal a uniform gap, not an irregular one, one that's not the same. So if your window looks like the window in the top right-hand picture where it doesn't, if you look at the meeting rail, those two surfaces should be flushed. That, that means the bottom sash hasn't closed the whole way. Well, either that means the window's out of square or you have some weather stripping that's gumped up or uh, gunked up with uh, debris often at the meeting rail if you have an interlock with weather, weather stripping or at the bottom, something's bent uh, and it's not closing fully. So although weather stripping can be a good thing, it can also, when, when it's not maintained, can be the cause of actually causing, more, it can be the cause of more air leaking in than it is about keeping the cold out. Sometimes the sash is the, is the weak part. If it has to be held together with a, a mending plate, maybe that joint is already too far gone. And certainly the one on the right is the mortise and tenon is rotted through. Uh, the one on the on the left of the slide, though, you can see there's a gap there. It would be very hard to build that back up. You're not going to have a good seal to the sill to the sill if the sash is missing some of its edge at the bottom. Maybe somebody's tried, tried to pry that window open one too many times. Um, most of our traditional windows operate with a, a counterbalance system of a cord or a chain that uh, attaches to a weight in the in the box or the around the outside of the frame of the window, and then to the sash. This is something that if those cords break, which they often do, they were cotton, they rot. Um, it's something that one could figure out how to replace. If there are a lot of really good YouTube videos that would, if you're feeling particularly do-it-yourself or uh, self, you could try to do these. Uh, you could maybe fix that yourself, but it's it's something that is not a reason to replace the window. If you can't do it, it's, it's a, a handyman project. It's not um, a major operation to get that fixed but you have to understand how to do it and, and get the thing put back together. And if you weather strip, if there is weather stripping on the window, it'll be important that you understand how that was put in and that you don't ruin the uh, benefit of the weather stripping in the process of trying to get the window operational and get the counterbalances back. Oftentimes operation is restricted by too much paint on the window and, and there are devices to try to cut that paint off or cut through the paint um, and sometimes it's just too much paint in the track itself that won't let the sash move because the layers of paint have built up and made the opening too small for the sash to move in. All these are problems that you kind of need to diagnose before you jump in and figure out whether you're going to be able to fix it or not. Um, the putty 
oh, can have a very long life if it's kept well painted that holds the glass in place, but it's not it's not forever and it, it's made up of linseed oil traditionally and uh, whiting uh, and the paint helps to protect it but in time sometimes it gets brittle and will uh, no longer serve its purpose and can be renewed often painters are capable of, of reglazing a window if the glass is not broken and you just need to renew the putty um, it's again it's not a reason to replace the window because the putty has failed and the paint itself, well, it's important that we keep our windows painted if we don't want the wood to rot. And if we have wood that's the age of most of these older windows, it's not wood that we can get today readily uh, that will have the same decay resistance that this older wood has. So it's it's important to try to take care of it and not wait till it gets to the point where it needs to be replaced because a new piece will not have the durability of the old wood. But if we look beyond the condition of the window at, at some of the other reasons why we might be thinking that we need to do something about the windows, like you, know, you think your heating bills are too high. Well, I think we need to step back and make sure we understand just how important windows are in that total picture of heat loss. They can be a significant piece, but according to the Department of Energy, I'm not talking about a preservation group here, they're saying that windows typically are going to account for 10 to 25% of the heat loss in your building. So they're not the total answer. Uh, if, you're, if you feel like your bills are too high, windows are not gonna erase them. Uh, heat loss through the window can occur through a couple of different mechanisms, but the, the loss through infiltration is typically a, only a quarter of the amount of heat that's going out that window. Most of it, 75% of it is going through the glass itself. The glass is a terrible, it's a great conductor of heat. Uh, and it's it's terrible at keeping the cold out or the, or the heat out, whichever the case may be. And in this comment, it's more about keeping the heat out sometimes. Um, so we need to really realize what is a reasonable expectation for upgrading the windows and how much better can they perform and not to expect more than we than is reasonable for what the problem might be. Um, borrowed these illustrations from a, a a very good book about windows where it kind of reminds us of the different mechanisms. The infiltration is the air that's just leaking around the window. It can leak between the sash and the jam. It can leak around the outside of the jam where there are weight pockets sometimes and probably especially bad on a frame house where there's a lot more room for infiltration. And then the other mechanism for heat transfer is conduction, conduction and radiation. Just as you feel warm standing next to a radiator, you're going to feel cold standing next to a cold piece of glass. But that the glass that's cold, the air moving over it by convection picks up the uh, allows the heat to be transferred to the glass and moved out. So it it can cr create sense of drafts even if the window itself is not leaking air. the The fact that you have a cold surface creates air movement that can make the window feel drafty that's not really coming from the leak of the window. One of the solutions to improving the performance of your window might be to add a storm window. And a lot of our windows in the city here do have storm windows on them already. They seem to be kind of a nuisance, but if you wanna have a screen, a storm window is part of the package that gets you the screen. Um, there have been some studies looking at the benefit of storm windows. Um, one of the most useful ones is the one from the Lawrence Berkeley lab. Again, this, you know, these are energy people. They're not preservation people. They don't have an agenda in making you keep your windows, but they do have an agenda in terms of trying to save energy. And their study indicates that the storm windows add to a, a, the average leaky window can improve the um, performance of the, the energy performance of that window to within about 10% of what a new insulated glass vinyl window would be. And if you put, you can put low E uh, on the storm window, uh, hard coat low E, it'll, it'll give you even the reduction in solar heat gain that's so important in our climate here. Storm windows are a traditional aspect of windows. We don't see them much around here because it was warm and mostly you'll see them in colder climates, but wooden storm windows have been used since, since the uh, well, in early parts of the 19th century and other parts of the country. And they can be a reasonable, attractive component of the window. And modern uh, modern options, like the one shown on the left, often allow you to leave the storm windows in place and just change out the bottom half to a screen so it's not the big 
seasonal change that often would discourage people from using those kind of storm windows. But we also have aluminum windows that have a very flat profile like the ones depicted in the middle. Those are more expensive than what I would get at the building supply store, but they can perform very, very well and, and not diminish the character of the window so much. And if you have windows that are curved in, in any way, there are plenty of manufacturers out there that can give you a storm window to fit any size or shape window. So that should not be a, re they will cost more, but the, the, um, the payback on the storm window has proved, it has been shown by studies to be well less than the payback on a whole new window. If you're going to use a storm window, it's really, uh, and that's a good storm window in the, on the window on the left, but wouldn't it have been better if, if we didn't highlight it? Like, you know, if we paint it the same color as the window or uh, as the sash or the, or the trim, it would tend to go away visually, which is usually a much better recommendation. We don't see much mill finished aluminum anymore, but you know uh, the problems with the storm window in the middle, though it may be functioning pretty well, um, it would have been nice if they could have afforded to bought one big one instead of two small ones to, to uh, cover that window. And we really don't want to see bare aluminum unless we're looking at maybe a 1960s house where aluminum windows were the, were the original finish. The window on the right is just a building supply storm window that came enameled. And it was then after installed painted to match the, the sash itself. So without much customization at all, a relatively inexpensive storm window was able to, to solve the problem on that uh, single glazed window. Storm windows can be used on the inside and they can have the added advantage of, of uh, diminishing leaks in the window from infiltration a little more effectively even than exterior ones. The, the window that to the outside should always be the leakier window to prevent condensation where you don't want it. The problem with these interior storm windows uh, is that you then have to store them when you want to take them down. But if you, if you kind of move from heating season to air conditioning season without ever opening your windows, then maybe these would not be a bad solution for you. And as long as you have a place to put them, if you do open the windows, then they can still be a good choice as well. So according to the uh, Department of Energy, a third to 40% of our total energy, energy costs are due to leaking, to infiltration. And the little pie chart there shows where all those leaks occur. But according to them, only about of all the of all the energy loss that we're losing to air leaking in and out, only about 10% of it is coming from the windows. So if if we're some studies suggest maybe it's a little more, but if we're really worried about the leaky window, we're probably worried about the wrong thing. It's it's really only three to ten percent of our total energy costs are going out that window through leaking. That's not to say the glass isn't a very big, important part. And that's where the storm window can really help, especially if we use low E. Why are we not? Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think I got a little more something going on here. Than I, I think you maybe zoomed in. I didn't. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't mean to zoom in. So I need to zoom out again here. Let me see if I can. Right that. Side. Let's see if I can. There we go. There we are. So uh, back to the idea that that you know if the window's leaking enough air to blow the curtains out, then you you clearly have a problem. But you you may still be cold even if the window's tight, only because of that idea of convection currents being set up by cold glass in front of the window. Weather stripping can help seal the window, uh, but weather stripping is not weather stripping that's effective is not an easy do-it-yourself job. It's important that you have the space for the weather stripping, that it did not interfere with the operation of the window. Um, it really is probably best left to someone who has some skills. Um, the, the weather stripping illustrated on the far right is a zinc interlocking weather stripping that was developed in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, it's expensive to install, it, it, it has limited applicability on a thin window where you have a plow for the cord that'll often get in the way of the weather stripping being effective. And it's really a terrible solution for the meeting rail or for the bottom because it uh, creates a, a space for, to collect debris, which can actually inhibit the closure of the window. I think it's a, a valid window, uh, a valid weather stripping to use in the tracks of a hung window. 
as is the cushion bronze shown in the middle there. And some of this stuff, you, if your window is a little bit loose, uh, adding one of these uh, spring bronze type weather strippings may be within the realm of someone who's reasonably handy uh, and can tighten up the window. But if the window's already tight, you won't have room to squeeze that in and then you'll create another problem. But we now have <clears throat> silicones and all sorts of, of um, synthetic materials that are very flexible and are quite good at sealing up gaps at the top and the bottom, as well as the meeting rail, much better than the old metal weather strippings did and, and can, be re, um, can be used to replace where some of the metal weather strippings were used historically. But that, that metal weather stripping has been around for well over a hundred years and you'll find it on, it on better windows. And if it's already in place, you would do wise to keep it except perhaps at the bottom or at the top where it might be trapping some dirt and, and, and getting in the way of the window actually closing. So if we've looked at all the options for upgrading the window we have and the, and the wood's not too rotted, like it's decided we can have maybe a storm window is not gonna work for us and, and or weather stripping is not going to be something we can find anybody to do. And you really are at the point where the window needs to be replaced. But I really would say we, we really should exhaust all these other possibilities, if at all possible, to make sure that we can, uh, that before we look at a new window, because a new window is not an inexpensive uh, solution, especially if you care about what it looks like. And it doesn't look like one of those windows I showed at the beginning of the, of the presentation. Uh, we want to have quality and durability, of course, and, and usually you get what you pay for. Uh, material can be varying materials. We have uh, fiberglass is emerging more and more as a common material for windows. Wood is certainly traditional, uh, but you're hard pressed to find wood that's um, as durable as some, many of these old windows are. Aluminum clad wood is, wood is very popular, which puts an aluminum surface to the outside where you don't have to repaint it. It's enameled and will have a very long lifespan. Um, vinyl has yet to, to produce a window that really effectively mimics the, the proportions and profiles of a traditional wood window. But you know maybe it's okay on a hidden spot on a building where you can't see it much and, and you don't want to spend the money, but it's not going to be the solution for the most part of the windows in your building. And aluminum can be a very effective uh, replacement material for windows in terms of matching, but it's that aluminum windows that do a good job of matching the profiles and proportions of a window are not inexpensive. They will cost every bit as much as the as the uh, aluminum clad wood ones in, in most cases, if not more. They're the, they're usually used on commercial properties and the average person is not usually doesn't want the aluminum finish on the inside and would rather have the warmth of wood even if it's painted on the inside of the building. So <clears throat> when we we go to look at a wood window, we may, you know, we're we usually are trying to match what the existing window is. But if you don't have a historic window, then you're really just trying to be compatible. And maybe you have one of those bad vinyl windows you'd like to turn into a better window. So you're looking at what would be the, the, the neutral generic appearance of a window for the, for the house or building that you have that's missing its historic windows. We, look at, we need to look at the dimensions of all the parts, the profiles of those pieces, and the overall proportions, their relationships to each other in order to achieve what can be an effective visual match. You know, you can step back and look and say, oh, this window matches or this window doesn't. But yeah, you know, sometimes you have to pull it apart, the little pieces to decide what you're going to, which things you're going to focus on. And I, I, I will assure you, unless you're going to a, a, a window shop and having a window made one on one, one by one for your personal uh, property, there's going to be some level of compromise, no matter how much, no matter which manufacturer you choose or how much you spend. The way we make a window today and the way it operates today is not going to equal the, the traditional historic window that you have in place. So you just have to accept that from the start and try to manage that compromise. So what we will walk through here in the next few minutes will give you some idea of some of the aspects that affect that sense of whether it matches or not. Glazing matters. Glazing, if, if, if it's a low, if you can add um, insulated glass to and all, almost any new window will have insulated glass. Um, low E added to that will certainly improve the energy efficiency both in the summer and the winter. But otherwise you want the glass to be as clear as possible so it doesn't look like it's a, a reflective glass. And then finally, ensuring 
how the window is installed and ensure or understanding how the window is installed and ensuring that it's installed in a, an appropriate way is really a big part of the picture. I wonder how many people who who have their windows replaced start by asking, well, of the installer, are you going to take the old window out first? Because more and more, what happens is that we leave the old window in place. We leave the jam in place and put the new window inside the old window. And that not, is not necessarily wrong, but it should it affects the choice of the window you, you use, and it can affect other things about the installation. So we need to really understand what our options are for each of these things. Oops, sorry. Um, the materials can be wood. And, and used to be there was a time that if it was a you said you were going to use a wood window, you got a pretty good match. Well, all three of these are wood windows, and they don't look very much the same. The one on the left is fairly traditional sight lines. The one in the middle, you know, it, it doesn't have any of the proportions, any of the, the offsets and the, the relative components of a traditional wood window, but it's a wood window. So is that a match just because it's wood, it doesn't look like a match to me for any window. And the one on the right, um, it, interestingly, they saved the transom, the lovely transom, and you can see they painted the sash red. Well, they painted the sash red of the new window as well. And the sash of the new window is all of about a half inch wide. And we have the trim piece is wider, but the sash is very narrow. They very kindly highlighted that it's um, disparity with the color, making it easy for us to see how that window doesn't match. Uh, it's the proportions are all off. The, the wrong pieces are the wrong, uh, are, different, are different sizes from what they would have been as a historic window. So let's step back to what are we going to replace? We could replace just the sash, either modifying the operation of the way or the balancing system or using the traditional one uh, by adding, and we can replace just the, uh, the sash and add a track so that we don't have to use the weights anymore. Uh, and if the sash is the only problem or we're just trying to make the window more energy efficient, maybe that's, you know, less is more. Replace less than you, or the less you replace probably the better. You could use an insert which sits within the jam and there are, there are replacement units that are designed specifically for that purpose. Or if, if you wanna get the best possible match, you're probably going to be better off starting all over with a whole new unit unless you can just get away with a sash only replacement. Well, there we go. Um, these illustrate the four levels of replacement. The one on the left is a new sash with insulated glass installed in the historic jam and reconnected to the, the counterbalance system, though it, it required a substantial increase in the weights in order to facilitate the doubling of the weight with the insulated glass. The next one is a, a sash and track system where the, the tan vinyl there uh, illustrates um, a vinyl track with a spring balance in it. So you no longer have to use the weights and the pulleys. So it facilitates a pretty easy way to get the added weight of the insulated glass. And if you don't um, paint your windows dark, you probably won't notice that vinyl track so much. Though some of the manufacturers of that particular system no longer are offering it, there are still some that do. Uh, the middle one is an insert unit. The original brick mold and blind stop were saved and then the window was pushed in from the inside behind the blind stop. Um, it meant that the, the it required that the overall frame be sound enough to accommodate this, but it then was is closer to a full replacement. And finally, the one on the right, the entirety of the old unit was taken out and a new unit was put in. Um, if you're gonna just do a sash, the jams really need to be sound and parallel. They can be out of square, uh, and that can be accommodated by ordering the sash a little bit bigger. And that's a problem even with the track ones. If you see there on the photo on the right, you can see how the, the sill is at an angle, but this, the sash is, is quite square. So it leaves a big gap on one side. So your brand new window isn't gonna fit very well if somebody doesn't use a little carpenter skill and plane that window to meet the angle. But that means you have to order the window appropriately so that there's room to plane it. Oh. But you, if you're doing a sash only replacement or even a sash and track, the sill must be repairable because a sill is often the most weathered part of the of the assembly. So that needs to be something that you can salvage. 
Uh, and it, it does give you the opportunity with very little intervention to add insulated glass to your window. It does not want to advance. Um, if you go with the track system, uh, you need to have a pretty sound frame, just as you would if you're just doing the, the sash with, with, the, with the old balance. It just makes it a little easier uh, from a technical point of view, of less carpentry is involved. Uh, but you do have to be willing to tolerate that light colored vinyl track because it's vinyl, it can't be painted. Uh, it needs to stay, the, which is going to be white or either or cream colored, one or the other. Those are your only choices, and we see a lot of those still around. And that's a good that's a, it's a good low impact way to upgrade the window. Uh, the insert unit, you still need to have enough of the jam that it gives you the something to solid to attach to, and if this if your unit's out of square, then this will solve that problem, but solves it with a caulking gun, so you'll have a less, uh, uh, less elegant solution to that. The, these kind of units can be wood, clad wood, or composite, or fiberglass even. Um, and the advantage to all the solutions we've spoken to up through this one are that the trim on the inside can stay in place. If you have woodwork that you don't want to have to take off and put back, which is very tedious to do without destroying it, then this is uh, even, you know, it, it's this is the most uh, replacement you can do without disrupting your interior. And I think that's a big incentive for a lot of people. And that's what ends up happening with a lot of the replacements that I see around town. But I wonder how many people stop and ask, well, you know, are we taking out the old window first? And if so, how um, is how carefully are you going to measure? Because this is these are both good examples where the tolerances were quite small. The windows were ordered to with very close tolerances. So you you really have to look carefully to realize that there's like, oh, and there's an extra blind stop here. There's one little extra piece, but otherwise these look very good. Let's see, um, they can be, sometimes it, they don't end up being in the quite the right position in the wall. And these are example, the one on the right is an example of where it's a rough opening type of unit that's been used in an insert fashion by just trimming the blind stop off with normally the blind stop stays in place. But it can work with a, a with a frame building or, or a brick building. Uh, there are little variations in the appearance if you look closely, but the overall effect is pretty good. Um, here's what happens when you install a, a rough opening unit in an existing jam without taking the jam out. The historic window on the left, and this was another opening of the building, they were doing this whole building. You can see we've reduced the glass size. So now there's twice as much wood around the, the perimeter. There's the original uh, brick mold, and then there's the new trim piece that adds another half inch to that and another blind stop, and you've doubled up the overall mass of the window. And if you look at it in isolation, maybe it doesn't look too bad, but when you compare it to what you had to start with, it's not the same. This this turret on the building on the on the right uh, is it's, it's always nice when people choose to replace one window and not the other because it gives us a it gives me a good chance to get a photograph of of just how different it can be. The windows on the bottom are the original wood windows in the building. They have fairly narrow sight lines, not too much frame around them. The window on the top is a replacement, but it's a replacement within the existing jam. It's what happened where someone didn't choose the uh, the solution for the insert quite as carefully as they might have or installed it with as much pain. So we we almost doubled up the amount of frame around the window. And it can have a, a, an impact of starting to make the windows look quite different in the overall picture of the building. Here's an example of a of an opening that's clearly very out of square. Uh, and there's been a lot of settlement in this building. But because the sash were ordered with enough, just the right amount of extra material so that they could be planed because they're wood sashes, then they they managed to meet the, the parallelogram that is the window opening and meet it with, with very little change in the proportions of the window. The meeting, the, the rail at the top of the top sash now is sort of a triangular shape piece, but it's better that than than this solution, which we can see in an adjacent building where 
there was a bad vinyl window in the left in this opening that's a little bit out of square. It's not as out of square as the one we just looked at before, but they can see the new window going in. There's nothing wrong with that window. It's a perfectly fine window, but uh, somebody didn't really want to have to pay much attention to fitting it carefully, and they ordered it about two inches too small all the way around. And so as you can see where they're working on installing it, and when they're all done, this is the solution we have. Well, it doesn't, despite the window being a better window, it doesn't look one bit better than what they had to start with, and we lost the detail at the head. So I think when we're, especially when we're doing an insert, there's a real a real uh, requirement that the that the installer do a, a, a precise job or we're gonna end up with windows that look like that. The full unit replacement really can give you the best, the best solution, but they're not all, these are all different brands and they all have different, different proportions, different components. The one in the, the second one over, the sight lines are very narrow. The, the sash is very small. And the one on the far right is a clad window. And on a clad window, they're designed to maximize the amount of, of, of glass and minimize the amount of frame. So the amount of frame is super, super narrow. It's, it's hard to see with that white, but if you wanna get a traditional look with a clad window, you have to have an accessory piece that gives you the effect of the brick mold that snaps into that window. That window could have been a little bit uh, more historically appropriate because you can see the brick mold, which is the outermost piece against the brick is about an inch and inch and a quarter to inch and a half around these other windows. On that window there, it's only about a half inch. So uh, a little modification would have allowed that to do very well. Uh, the original window on the left here in this picture, a historic window, uh, you know, you can see that the, a, a brick, uh, a rough opening unit with a brick mold. So it has the same kind of three step. There's the sash, blind stop, brick mold, that the three pieces of a traditional wood window that, the clad window there, it's just a really skinny piece. It's not, it's easy to, it's easy to get that right if we just do a different installation. The more complicated your windows are, his existing windows, probably the more effort you would want to make to keep them. Because uh, if you have any of the features that we'll look at here, it's really hard to get it right. Uh, we can see the picture on the left, they didn't even try between the historic window at the bottom and the window at the top. And you would be surprised how many of those I see around town in our historic districts where I don't know who's minding the store, but they seem to get by. Um, a lot of these windows were square sash with a curved glass. It just, the frame was curved on the outside. Some have an arched head, but these two windows uh, with the fancy brickwork around them, both of those made a really, a, a, a good effort to try to get a modern window to meet that arch. And neither one was all that successful, despite the expense that I'm sure they went to to do that. They both look a little awkward. Um, and the one on the right, of course, is, is stuck with the track issue. But it's very hard to get the measurements right and to get these windows installed correctly. If you have transoms, like the lovely detail of the dark green frame in the left is just like it would be tragic to lose that. And who knows what we lost for the one, the replacement window next to it, where we have a nice big flat band. Uh, I'm sure there was something more than that there for that window to start with. Now they did fortunately keep the stained glass and put a, a, a storm panel over it on the outside. So that, that was salvaged. But th the more of these details your windows have, the more important it's, pro it's going to be to try to hold on to them if, if it's at all possible, because you're going to lose the richness that that is inherent in these features that we, we, we're not gonna put it back without great expense. Um, a lot of our windows have, when they're pushed together, have mullions and the, the size of, the, some of them have some detail to that mullion. I see ones around town that are carved like columns and other things, but it's the reason for that thing to be there is that you needed a space for those weights that are balancing the window. So the width of the mullion was equivalent to what is necessary for a couple of pairs of weights. Well, modern windows don't have weight. So if you just order the window without thinking about what was there before, you're going to end up with a mullion that looks like this. Well, you've got more glass area, but it changes the proportions and the character of that opening. So if you're willing, if you really want it to look the same, you need to think about that because your window supplier probably won't. And you'll end up losing that 
uh, losing that proportion to the window. Uh, finally, uh, a lot of our windows have, have muntins dividing the glass into small panes. The illustration on the left, the historic window at the top, muntins were often quite narrow. They could be as little as five eighths of an inch. Some could be as much as an inch and a half, depend, especially for a two over two. The window at the bottom is a window with true insulated, with insulated glass and true divided lights. When you use insulated glass, the muntins can't be that slender. The result is we now tend to use what we call simulated divided lights. We put a grid on the outside, we put a grid between the two pieces of glass, and we put a grid on the inside. Well, given we're trying to squeeze this all into a sash that didn't have insulated glass, then we end up cheating the profiles of both the inside and the outside. If the flatter it gets on the outside, the less shadow line we have. The most tradition, most uh, inch and three-eighths sash will only have a three-eighths inch deep putty bevel on the outside. So it's not too hard to get that right. We just cheat the inside profile a little bit. What we never want to see, I would think, is the window in the middle where the grid is only between the glass, because that just looks fake. Like I'm sure to even the most uneducated viewer would think there's something wrong with that window, that it, it looks like something that uh, was clearly a modern replacement and isn't very convincing at, at capturing the, the character of the building. It's because it doesn't have any shadow lines. I mean, the way we perceive all these shapes is through shadows that, that are created by the different elements. So I, I, there's a large building in my own neighborhood that has um, Sandwich muntins only in the most recent replacement. I don't know what happened, but it's it should not be an acceptable solution. And it's not it's not that difficult to get the simulated divided light if you're going to replacement. So aspects of match to consider, does the window really fill the opening? Is glass size close to what the historic glass was? Are the sash components proportional? The brick bowl, blind stop, uh, sash, are they all relatively similar? Are they the relationship to each other the same in the new window as they are in the old? Is the muntin width accurate and the depth of the muntin adequate to make it seem convincing? Are the size and profiles of any mullions and transoms accurate? These are things that you need to think about when before you order that window or make sure that your, your supplier is realizes that they matter and they matter to how the window looks when it's done. And does the trim have the right size and shape? A lot of little fine details may not matter, but you have to stop and step back and think when you look at a window, what do you see? What can you see? I, I like this example because the historic window on the left, though it's covered with a storm window, um, is the original window. The replacement window on the right did a really, um, admirable job of trying to match the window. And for many of us, we probably would say, that's fine if they only hadn't painted it white, you know, who would have noticed? But if you were a keen observer, you will notice quite a few things. One, the window is pulled forward in the opening. It's now not as, uh, there's not as much reveal between the window and the storm window on the other side makes that a little harder to understand. Um, two, the Muntins are all the same width. If you look at the historic window, the ones on the, and these are all simulated muntins on the right, they could have just as well been right. The, the, the upper sash has very narrow muntins on the original window. The ones in the new window, a little wider. Whereas the, the vertical muntin in the center of the bottom sash is much wider than those in the top. The one on the right, they're all the same. Now these are all fine points, but it just goes to show that there, you know, it's not to say this window on the right is is acceptable or isn't acceptable, but how much can you get and how so but we're there's going to be compromise if you replace the window with the average replacement window. And some of these things, if you just think to ask the right questions, you'll get a better match. But it's up to you to be a good consumer if you're what you're trying to do is match the window, assuming you need to replace it. But if it has a storm window on it, chances are it's protected a good bit. It pro probably doesn't need to be replaced in the first place, but uh, we'll see. So in, in, uh, in sort of summary here, historic windows are certainly important to the character and integrity of our buildings. They are sustainable if we keep them, 
they represent embodied energy and a certain value because new windows are not cheap. And if they are repairable, if they haven't been left to go too far, they can still have a very long lifespan because they are repairable. You can repaint them, you can uh, do incremental repairs that can in improve their, their longevity. And if with some supplemental storm glazing, they really can perform competitively with a replacement window. Replacement windows, which sometimes really, the window's too far gone, or it's just not reasonable. You can't find somebody to do the repair work that's necessary. They can be an, a, a reasonable solution, but they will generally require some level of compromise in the appearance. And, you know, the city's probably not going to be your hardest critic on this. You should be. You should be wanting the window to not to, to compromise the richness and character that that window adds to the composition of your historic facade. And they can be a cost effective and improve the energy performance if your window is too far is too far gone. But you just have to realize that it's it's not a simple matter to say, oh, I'm gonna go get a new window and you're gonna end up with the perfect thing. So that's the end of what we have for today. <laughs> it's probably more than you can digest, but no, I appreciate John, your that, attention. Was, that was fascinating. I'm gonna be out on my block <laughs> here today inspecting all the homes and the windows. Well, just look, and that's the other thing. If you're going to buy a window, look at someplace else where that window is installed. Mm -hmm. the, if, if the guy's selling it to you, surely in a city the size of Washington, you can find another building that has that window and has it put in by the same installer. So you can see, like, are you going to notice these differences and do you care? Right. Um, so we actually have several questions. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. So. Mm -hmm. We'll try and get through as many of these as possible. Just real quick um, for everyone, tell us the difference between muntins and mullions. The muntin is the small piece of wood that, that separates one pane of glass from the other. It holds the glass within the sash. The mullion is the structural element between window units, which usually accommodated the weights that uh, and, and could could also accommodate structure if the window was a very wide opening. Okay, thank you. So um, someone's asking, I have one over one wood sashes in a historic district. Only the top tier of four are racked and I would rather not replace them. Can I cut a triangular piece off the top and reverse it and put it on the bottom of each window? Well, the window, the, the, the way a window is constructed, the, the sides of the sash are called the styles, and they usually run all the way through. And then the rail is more just intended in this way. So you can't really just, if you cut a piece off, you're gonna end up with a, two or three pieces of wood. It's not like a single piece of wood. Um, you can augment the, the, the uh, especially at the top would be more easily done where it's gonna be hidden by the blind stop a little bit. You could modify that a bit. Um, but you also could buy a new sash, <laughs> which if you order it enough, you realize how much you need to trim and order it appropriately and then plane it away, then you're not having to add something on. And that would that's what was done in some of those windows that we looked at earlier where the, the window was so out of square and it was a sash only replacement. Those were new sashes that were used to do that. But mm -hmm. if, if you, um, if you really want to try to hold on to the one over one sash that you have, you're probably better off just getting a new piece of wood, uh, gluing it on and screwing it in and then planing it after the fact, but you'll have to take the sash out to do that. Okay. Um, there was a process to replace the sides of windows and get rid of cords and fill the weight channels, but no one talks about that or about using the window but retrofitting double panes into the old double hung. Well, you the problem with if most of our windows, in, unless you have a very fine house or a larger building, they're inch and three, three eighths thick. That's pretty standard. The, the depth of the sash is inch and three eighths. Better windows are inch and three quarters. The problem is the, the sash are not that sturdy. And if you're going to open and close them, and you have to route it out to fit to hold the insulated glass. It's it's going to present um, compromise to the structure of the window. There are 
two companies now, at least, that are making vacuum seal glass, which is very thin. Um, it's it's a, it, instead of having argon gas inside, it's a vacuum. Um, there, it's it, expect in time it will come down in price. That would be a much better option for reglazing an existing sash than would the traditional because if you the you the ideal space between two pieces of glass for energy efficiency is a half inch. Then you add two pieces of eighth inch glass and and you have you have all three quarters of an inch and that's that's too deep to fit in your average window. Most wood windows, new wood windows have a smaller airspace than what is really ideal because you can only squeeze so much stuff into the space that only had a piece of one eighth inch glass before. Um, I think we've seen some successes with retrofitting, especially larger commercial sash with insulated units, but usually those are windows that don't have to open and close. And the problem is then if you add the windows and the one, one of those illustrations is, a, is my own house where I did, I put, use new sash even with insulated glass and I had to double the weights. Well, by doubling the weights, then if you don't have a lot of space, then you don't have as much travel distance to the to the um, window. You may not be able to open it as far. So the operational stuff gets a little more complicated when you add insulated glass, which means more glass. The glass is the weight to the window. And it can also be difficult to create a good seal to hold that insulated glass in. And, and it, the putty is not enough to hold an insulated glass uh, pane into the into the frame. OK. Uh, let's do two more. Um, this this one is a multi multi question. So um, I had my sash windows restored about ten years ago. They operate beautifully. They have new weather stripping. They seem tight. I was so infatuated with their beauty. I did not get storm windows. That may have been a big mistake because in cold weather I get condensation sometimes quite a lot. So here's here are the three questions. Could this be due to failure of putty glazing? Do I need to get storm windows for the interior? And if so, doesn't that leave the windows themselves more vulnerable to the elements? Um, there's no there's no failure in the window that you in terms of the causing the condensation. The condensation it, it, in the winter time, if we generate moisture in our houses, the window serves as a dehumidifier because you know you're it's like a cold glass in the summertime. It'll get condensation on. So you can. You can stop the condensation by making your house super dry, which would be terrible for you uh, and probably impossible if you take a shower or cook anything. Um, or you can add a storm window and you can add a storm window inside or outside. The adding the storm window on the inside will mean that you will have to store it when you want to open the windows and have to have a place to do that. But it will leave the window looking better on the outside. And if you have um, just one over one sash, you're probably not going to notice it on the outside as much as if you have the Munton divisions, because when you you kind of lose some of that under the, the glass of an exterior storm window. But there's no question that an exterior storm window will protect the window. It'll increase the, the life of the paint. It'll um, it, it can incorporate the screen that you need to use anyhow in this city for uh, summer operation of the window. So it's it's not necessary if you're using a screen anyhow you already have something on the outside, and if you use an aluminum storm window you have very low maintenance. If you really want it to look cool and old you can get a a wood storm window, uh, but then you're going to have to paint that too. But yeah the the storm window definitely is a is a protection for the window. It's a reversible thing, uh, and it doesn't have to look terrible. Um, we you know a lot of there are, there are several companies that make low profile, relatively flat looking ones that look not unlike a wood storm window, as we can see from some of those illustrations. So I were for one would opt for the exterior storm window um, just for the redu reduction in maintenance so that your your nicely restored windows will will have a longer uh, life between paint jobs. And then, and the, by the way, the storm window can have. Sorry, back the storm window. You can buy the storm window with hard coat low E, so that will improve your solar heat gain coefficient, which means you'll get less uh, solar heat gain in the summertime, and it will improve the just the conduction of 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 heat through the glass in the wintertime. So 
either way, inside or outside, I would say it's a good idea if you have a single glazed window. Okay, and then we have um, one more question, and I don't think we cover this topic. When considering repair or replacement, how do you balance historic windows and emergency egress requirements when original windows are too small to meet egress requirements in residential buildings? We we do face that with the tax credit program here. Uh, I, I for years looked at projects in Vermont and Vermont has a lot of affordable housing in old houses. Uh, everything's sort of small scale there. And a lot of times the window, the, the hung sash did not meet egress requirement, the minimum dimensions for um, egress. And a lot of these buildings, they were not sprinkling these little wood frame buildings in places where there wasn't enough water pressure to even do it. Um, not that usually you need to sprinkle anyhow now. Um, we have, there was a company, there's a window company in Vermont that made a casement sash that was extra deep and cut back. So we had a little bit of a shadow line at the meeting rail and we accepted those like one per sleeping room, which is what was really the minimum required. Every window did not have to do that. It's not ideal, but sometimes the priority of safety, human safety, just like with lead, paint, you know, we have that has to come first and the the historic value gets compromised a little bit. Any manufacturer can give you a, a casement window with a mountain across the middle that has the depth of the meeting rail, but it won't have the shadow line created by the meeting rail. So well, the only way to do that is just to make the, the sash very deep, the casement sash very deep and then cut back a little bit. And there is one company that does that just a little bit, but I think that you know it's it's a concern we need to acknowledge and, and compromise to accommodate. Yeah, definitely. So we've had more questions come in, but we're at the end of our time. So John, what are some, my my final question for you, what are some um, resources that people can check out maybe through technical preservation services or the local historic preservation office? Um, for example, I know that uh, the design guidelines from the city for windows, they have at least some uh, a good graphic that shows the parts of a window cover some of the vocabulary that you went over today. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you would like to just highlight for the audience? I don't know if we posted any of those studies. Um, I thought we did for a while that showed the value of a storm window uh, with our some of our energy material on the technical preservations website the, under the Park Service uh, TPS. If you Google technical preservation services, you will find what we have. There's a brief on energy. And I thought for a while we did have some of that material up, but those studies that I cited, most of them are quite old, but they're still valid. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if you're interested in trying to do something yourself, there are a lot of YouTube videos. And I, I hope that someday we will use some of the Park Service uh, carpentry staff that's a bit, that works out of Frederick. I would like it if they would produce a, 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 a non-proprietary <laughs> uh, video about how to do some of the simple things like just getting your uh, uh, cords restored to so your weights work on your windows. Um, but it's a lot to undertake and, and you know, do look at what, don't look at a single, uh, a single person's suggestion of how to do it. Uh, I would, I would recommend there's, there's a book called the Window Bible by um, Jordan is the author. And it includes like weather stripping, you that's really even rare. Like if you're looking at your window and you don't know what the heck you have, I'll bet he has analyzed it there. And it has, it's a very good uh, how-to book in terms of all the details that that we've talked about here today and many more. So of all the the uh, reference works, I would say for window repair, I would put that one very high on the list. Okay, awesome. That's good to know. And I will just also make a plug too for our contractor database at bcpreservation.org where um, if you do have additional questions and you're looking for uh, someone that knows Windows, you can at least maybe find a few different vendors that could um, give you some different estimates and you can maybe shop around a little bit so you make a good decision. Let me put in a plug for improving the database. And that is if you've had work done on your Windows, by someone who's maybe not, that's not what they mostly do and they are and they wouldn't mind doing some more and you don't see their name on our database, 
give Zach or somebody in the yeah. office a call. We need to populate that more with people who do modest things, handyman type people who know what they're doing. We don't have enough of that. It, we, we're, you know, let's help us make that list more useful. Yeah, thank you so much. See, John, you were you were our previous president. I appreciated <laughs> that plug. And I just shared that with everyone. Um, and you can also email me at Zach at dcpreservation.org. Well, John, thank you so much. I think we're going to have to have you back in the future and for longer <laughs> because there's so many questions and um, everyone wants your opinion on Windows. So thank you again. All right. Thank you. Happy to do it. Bye. Have a good day, everyone.